Thank you so much for coming. My name is Warner Jackson. I'm one of this group of writers. And I feel I've been lumbered with something. Um, <laughs> writing the book was a very much a collective effort. And when Rebecca and Amanda first came to see me to ask if I'd be part of this book, I was a bit hesitant. I'm a, I say a fastidiously slow writer. Others say I'm a notoriously slow <laughs> writer. Um, so I was somewhat hesitant, but I agreed, and I'm so pleased that I did, and I'm proud to have been part of this Nuwapu. And I enjoyed the sort of collaborative na nature of the work. And so when tonight was mooted, it was originally going to be a collaborative again, and everyone along here was going to speak. Um, now it's just me. <laughs> so they can't complain about what I might say. Um, but I do want to thank um, Bridget Williams Books for being so willing to support the co proper of this book. And to all of those who bought it, it it's been a real excitement to be on the bestseller list. I've never been on a bestseller list. When I was younger, I had delusions about being a pop star. <laughs> um, those were shattered really quickly because I can't sing. <laughs> I, I sort of ruin the myth, the stereotype that all Māori had natural rhythm and can sing. <laughs> so I couldn't become a pop star, but the idea of being on a bestseller list never, never left me. And so the first time I saw the Unity Books bestseller list and we were on it, it was like a dream come true. And so it's lovely to be here today. And when I realised I was the one being left to speak, I, I did what I normally do. And those of you who know me, I went for several walks. I, I find going for walks is a way in which I can think about what I'm going to say. Because, I, because I'm such a slow writer, I never write speeches. I don't write papers. But I go for walks and think about what I'm going to say. The walks aren't as long, sadly, now as they used to be, but I still went for walks and as often happens, a, a jumble of thoughts came about what I might say tonight. And so because I'd never forgotten my training as a law student at Victoria, I, I sort of put them into three separate but interrelated parts. The first part is change. The second part is te tiri te o waitangi. And the third part is the Battle of Gettysburg. Mm. And they may not seem connected, but I hope <laughs> that the links will become obvious. The, the idea of change is what I think the book is about. To change this country from its continuing state as a colonising state to something different and something better. But when you talk about change, you have to be aware, I think, that there are different types of change. Because change is not always for the better. And so there's what I call a persecution change. Change which brings persecution and suffering to others. And the colonization of this country was a persecution change. It subjected Māori people to hardship, to violence, to suffering, which we are still struggling, struggling to recover from. And that is a change that we should never forget, either in terms of the history of the change or its persistence today. And one of the way it persists it seems to me as a recognition that colonisation had occurred, but it's something in the past. But when I ask people, well, 
if it was just in the past, when did it finish? No one has been able to give me a satisfactory answer. And I think you can't find a satisfactory answer because it hasn't yet finished. It has changed, it has morphed over the years. But this is still a country that lives not just its colonising past, but in the presence is still trying to deal with the consequences of that past. And so the sort of change that I think this book talks about is what I call a hopeful change. A change in which we can hope for something better. Something that gives everyone in this country not just a place to be here, but a place to be who they are, to fulfil all of their dreams, and to make this a sort of country that Te Te Rutia Waitangi envisaged. And sometimes the difficulty of that, which is alluded to, I think, in several of the pieces in the book, is that we sometimes elide colonisation. We sort of pretend it isn't relevant. And I don't know if you saw just yesterday, uh, the Ministry of Justice released a report on how so many victims of wrongdoing by Māori are other Māori. Māori who do wrong tend to hurt other Māori. And they came up with three reasons for that each of which is debatable, one of which, in my respectful view, is fatuous. The first view is that Māori hurt Māori through wrongdoing because we are a young population. And there's a cliché in criminological theory that crime is a habit of the young. So there's a certain substance in that, but it seems to me a very simplistic and victim-blaming reason. The second reason they gave is because Māori are poor. And that's a particularly offensive analysis, but which also has a certain germ of truth wrongdoing in the sense of criminal offending tends to affect people who live in poverty or what in the past I've called cycles of confinement. And the third reason, they said, well, we don't, we don't really know. There's a third group of people who, have been, who are Māori who have been hurt by crime and we can't find a reason. And this is where I think the eliding of colonisation comes into play. Because Māori are not poor, their second analysis, are not poor by accident. Māori are poor because of the history and the consequence of colonisation. And part of a hopeful change for me the sort of hope that each of the writers in the book talked about is that we will no longer confine colonisation to a certain historical period, but confront that it's still with us and we need to deal with its current manifestations. Which brings me to Te Tere Te Waitangi. Because if there is proof of the ongoing presence of colonisation, that is the constant crown reinterpretation and redefinition of what the treaty promised. The treaty, I think, was an amazing document for its time and for today, because it offered people, no matter where they came from, a place in this land. It said, you are welcome to make your home here. But that welcome also had a certain list of obligations that it placed on those who came. 
And one of those that was that you can make your home in this land, but not at the expense of the people who are already here. But of course, colonization always works at the expense of the people who are already here. And I spoke a couple of years ago at a housing conference where there's a lot of talk about homelessness as a current social problem. And I'd like to suggest that homelessness began in 1814 because Māori were deprived of the right to be at peace at home. The problem we have now is one of houselessness. And if we can solve the problem of houselessness, then we make it easier for people to feel at home. But part of the solution to the houselessness is to remedy the homelessness which colonisation has caused. And the answer to that lies in Te Tiri Te Waitangi. Which brings me to the Battle of Gettysburg. I don't know if any of you have been to Gettysburg in the United States. One of the great, most violent and bloody battles of the American Civil War. And the site is now a shrine in America. And battle sites in a country's history should be enshrined in the memory. <clears throat> but the key is what is enshrined. And I remember the first time I went to Gettysburg, I was very much aware of the millions of African-American people who were captured in slavery, the millions of Native Americans who were colonized were not part of the enshrining. Even though they were caught up in that bloody war, they were silenced in the history. And so there's always a danger when you enshrine a place when you tell a history that there will be exclusions. And one of the concerns I have about the long overdue recognition of the battles which were fought in this country after 1840, one of the difficulties about remembering the wars which the Crown waged against Iwi and Hapu is that there has been a similar excluding and the similar creation of a grand narrative which tries to minimise what the wars were about, the need to make Māori people homeless and the cost of those battles. And so I hope as we learn more about the wars and what they were done, what happened because of the wars, which is part of the decolonizing project, we will tell the whole story rather than just some tidy version of history. And the other thing that the Battle of Gettysburg always reminds me of is the speech which Abraham Lincoln, the president at the time, gave at Gettysburg after the battle. When one of the most famous quotes in all of his wonderful oratory was to speak of government of the people, for the people and by the people. And it seems to me that prior to 1840, Iwi and Hapu had our own systems of government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It was a mokopuna-centric constitutional system. Nowadays, in one of the constant redefinitions of the treaty relationship, 
The Crown talks about developing programs by Māori and for Māori. And there's a certain positive advance in that, I think. But what is missing from the for and by is the policies of Māori, by Māori, for Māori. Because if you recognise policies of Māori, then you recognise what the treaty relationship is all about. The right of Māori to continue to self-determine their own future. And in my contribution to the book Imagining Decolonisation, I talked about restoration, restoring certain things, certain values that I think come from the ineffable beauty and hopes in this land, restoring the sense of justice and harmony that the treaty envisaged, and restoring for Māori that sense of government, that sense of self-determination that is of the people, not just by Māori, for Māori. And when we get to that last point, then we have decolonised this country. We have reached the justice of change. We have fulfilled the hope of change and finally left behind the persecution of change. And what I hope this little book does is give us some tools, but perhaps most importantly, the confidence and the willingness to dream about what that change might look like. I thank you again for coming tonight. I hope you will continue on that journey of change. And if you do, I wish you well. It seems to me that change can often be difficult, but it's a wonderful difficulty because it challenges the intellect it challenges the courage, it challenges the ability to dream. And I wish you well in all of that. Thank you again for coming. Kia ora.